Hey guys, welcome to another video from Historic Militaria. Today we're going to be looking at a revolver, which for its time was uh, getting outdated, but none nonetheless saw service with the Japanese armed forces through World War II, and that is the Type 26 revolver. Now this gun was uh, introduced in about 1893 when it was designed to replace Japan's aging uh, set of Smith & Wesson new model number threes, which had been in service for quite some time, but uh, they needed a more modern revolver, and so the Type 26 was born. Uh, these were made sort of sporadically up until about 1923, and then there was a, an earthquake at the arsenal and kind of destroyed the arsenal, so the revolver kind of fell out of um, favor in terms of manufacture. So production sort of went over to more semi-automatic pistols at that time. You had uh, Nambu's designs kind of kicking around and, and there was enough interest in semi-autos to kind of put this on the back burner. However, these guns had a very, very long service life. Um, the majority of like I said, were made before 1923, and they were still going strong in 1945, and were fairly commonly encountered by U.S. forces wherever Japanese forces fought. Now, they did come in sort of five distinct um, batches that collectors will note. The first is going to be a type that is <clears throat> very early production. There are no external markings. Very few of those were made. Then there's a type which actually is going to have uh, the arsenal markings on the side here, but no serial number. And again, not many of those. And then you're going to have your standard production, which this one is a part of. And that's from about serial number 1000 through about serial number 58,900-ish. And that's going to be your standard production. Those guns were uh, nicely blued with charcoaled or heat treated uh, small parts, certainly your hammer, your um, trigger. This trigger has faded a little bit, but you can still see some of the fire blue there. And also this, uh, your pivot pin. Uh, you notice it's also faded there. However, on the hammer, it is nice and vivid, nice and blued. Um, and that this would be sort of the standard production type that was in production from about 1893 to about 1923. Also, you had the uh, checkered wood grips. Um, when these were arsenal overhauled, which is another uh, commonly encountered variant, and that's gonna be the arsenal overhaul type. A lot of times these grips were replaced with uh, serrated grips, which actually had the serrations going up, up them, and those would be the arsenal replacement for damaged uh, checkered grips. Also, uh, generally they would be re-blued, refinished, and you'd have a flat blued uh, finish to your small parts, so you're not gonna have your fire blue on your trigger and your hammer and your pivot pin here. And then there were a very few made after 1923, um, sort of from potentially pieces, parts that, that were found after the earthquake apparently, and only a few hundred of those, and those brought serial numbering up to about the low 59,000s. This guy is in the early 40,000 serial number range, and he, uh, or actually all these guns, were made at Koishikawa Arsenal, um, which again was destroyed in 1923 by an earthquake. And the symbol for that arsenal is, looks like some concentric circles, but actually is meant to be a stack of cannonballs viewed from the top. You can see three cannonballs plus one on the top for a stack of four. And then you've got your uh, Japanese kanji here, which bas basically just says type 26, and then your serial number. Um, these are sort of an amalgamation of a number of, of different revolvers. They've got the break open uh, 
cylinder of the Smith & Wesson. And they also have a very interesting um, locking mechanism or accessibility to the locking mechanism based on the French uh, Ordnance Revolver, also known as the Model 1892 uh, LaBelle Revolver. So uh, basically the way these come apart or the way you would get into them, and I'm gonna do a separate video on this just to show because a lot of people damage their guns trying to do it. But what you do is you just pull down on the back of your trigger guard here, push in a little bit and pull down. Do not use a tool and it'll just pop off. And then this will swing down to its limit and then right here you see that that is actually where your fingernail would go and when this is all the way down you can just use your fingernail to literally lift this out and open this up and it is hinged right here so this plate just opens up to the rear exposing all your internal lock work and we'll show that in part two uh, a little bit easier to deal with when i've got both hands free now these guns fired a unique cartridge uh, it was called the 9 by 22 rimmed and it's a nine millimeter revolver round which only uh, was used as far as i know and i'm pretty sure about this only used in the japanese uh, type 26 it was you know a lot of people will say it was underpowered but it was very comparable to the smith and wesson uh, 38 not the 38 special but just the 38 which was actually the british standard caliber in world war ii so you really can't give the japanese too much flack about using kind of an underpowered caliber the british did it too a lot of people found their revolvers um just kind of a a small gun that would be used only for defense they didn't have the mindset of the americans which the revolver would be a much bigger round you know 45 long colt 44 40 you'd see in american revolvers so for a lot of europeans and the japanese it was a purely defensive gun firing a round that is something akin to a 32 ACP probably in terms of, of stopping power. And as always, uh, Japanese cartridges, original Japanese cartridges, are not going to have any markings on the head stamp. So you've got the blank head stamp for uh, vintage World War II Japanese manufactured ammo. Um, again, you can see the bluing on this one is really nice. This is actually one of the nicer ones i've seen you don't see them in this condition too often most of them actually went through a lot of hard service in china and the south pacific this one probably spent the majority of its time in japan um, one interesting feature of these guns um, sort of a drawback is that when they were uh, loaded the cylinder could spin freely the only time the cylinder was locked is when the gun was firing when the hammer was actually pulled back during the firing process then it would lock otherwise you could say fire two or three rounds out of your six round cylinder and then this could easily get jostled in in the heat of battle and suddenly you find yourself clicking on empty cartridges so really a design flaw in that respect the other thing is this gun is only capable of uh, double action firing it does not have it is hammer fired but it is uh, a long trigger pull there's no way to cock it so as you can see while it is a very smooth trigger pull it is very long and again the british did this with their um infield revolvers during world war ii uh, to appease the tank core where uh, the hammer spurs could catch on various pieces of a confined vehicle what they would do is actually bob the hammers um, so that it would be double action only this one started out life as a double action only and these were all designed that way so uh, long trigger pull not very pleasant to shoot not very easy to make it accurate but it is what it is uh, these also came 
with a typical Japanese style holster. You got uh, your leather with brass fittings. And on this particular example, it's a clamshell design. Um, the majority are going to have uh, kanji with a date uh, underneath here. This one's a little bit worn off. This holster has been with this gun uh, since it was actually brought back uh, at the end of World War II. So it has uh, been with this gun probably originally. Um, and just a very typical holster with your ammo pouch here. And you can take a look in here. Uh, this would hold 18 rounds of ammunition. There's several layers for uh, cartridges to slip into that. So you'd have 18 rounds here, assuming you carried six in the gun, so 24 rounds total. You also have your unique cleaning rod for these guns. And the cleaning rods are a little bit hard to find these days. Um, just uh, nothing too amazing about it, but they would fit in this little pouch right here. And they just sort of slip in there and just stay there with you the majority of it being underneath your clamshell in terms of opening these guns up uh, it's just a very simple top break so just like a smith and wesson you just leverage that up and this one will eject your spent shells in typical smith and wesson fashion uh, throws out your your six spent shells and then you just load it back up and you've got your um, rebounding hammer in these actually so it's a nice little safety feature the hammer will only come through when it is pulled all the way or the firing pin will only come through when it's pulled all the way um, this one really doesn't look like it's been fired very much the bore is in excellent condition um, I kind of wonder how much service this gun actually even saw. It's mostly just holster wear on this one. Um, they also have a lanyard ring, which is typical of pretty much all guns at that time. They did have a, I believe a cotton and cloth lanyard as well, like a lot of Japanese pistols. Um, in terms of reliability, they are extremely well made. They are extremely reliable guns. Uh, really, if I had to have my choice of a Japanese pistol from World War II to carry, I'd probably want to go with one of these. Uh, the Nambu and the uh, Type 94 are just kind of not the best guns either, and they are underpowered as well. And they've got their own flaws, so it's kind of you're damned if you do, damned if you don't on these. And the one thing that did surprise me first handling one of these is how small the grip feels in my hand. Um, that's just a really small grip and the revolver itself weighs a, just under two pounds. Uh, so it's a pretty light gun. It's a pretty small gun. Um, it is compact. It is a nice revolver for what it is. Um, the double action only is a problem, but again, you're not looking for tactical shooting here. You're just looking for a collector item. Uh, the ammunition is pretty much unobtainium, and what you're going to find is going to be pretty expensive out there. Um, in shooting quantities, good luck. You're really not going to find any that's worth uh, shooting up. Even the modern production stuff is so hard to find and expensive, you're not going to be shooting these much. But uh, thanks for taking a look at the Type 26 with me. And as always, remember to like and subscribe. And if you've got one of these, I'd love to know about it. And if you know the backstory of it, thanks for watching. And remember, like, subscribe, and that'll get more videos done sooner. Thanks a lot.